Norway was great. I had a really good time there. And um, I don't know, it was, going into that bar was, for me, really important. So when I went for the first time was in 2017, I believe. And I was with a few friends. And yeah. we um, all were wannabe bartenders back then. So we were bartenders, but we would, we didn't have the skill. And we couldn't officially call ourselves bartenders yet. So we went to the Savoy to... Um, check out what the greatest bar in the world was like because they won the award for like two three years in a row it was close to work um so yeah we sat down straight away the environment the music everything and it was just not just glamorous but very very precise in everything and when we ordered the first round of drinks the bartender was italian and what i noticed about um how their staff work is everyone will do a bit of everything. So everyone will be waitering tables. Everyone will be um, making drinks. Everyone will be collecting glasses. So that part I found quite interesting. So when we ordered the first round of cocktails, um, we went to the bar to see the bartenders uh, shake and um, just seeing how the bar was. And um, when they saw something was not normal with us, they're like, are you guys okay? And we're like, yeah, we just, well, we want to be bartenders and we just want to see how it is. And then they brought us behind the bar and showed us how everything is, how they keep their bars clean, how they keep everything nice and organized. It was just like, it was like a racing car driver going to see a Ferrari, basically. We were all oh, really... Shit. They were that cool, huh? Could be. Yeah, they were really... The, the hospitality they done was great. So then they, um, they took us behind the bar, showed everything. And then once we sat down, they all made a special cocktail on the house. Um and they just explained every single drink. And yeah, that kind of really gave me a big motivation when I was younger to be a bartender. So that memory is always going to stay with me. And then fast forward to four years ago, um, it's kind of still the same. I was looking at the bar and all their uh, speed pourers were pointed to one direction. I was just checking the glass and every glass was pinpoint polished. It was just so well done and very precise. And of course, yeah. you know, if they have that... Um, that legacy of being one of the best in the world they have to keep it so yeah it was, it was a great 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 visit and i'll i won't wait four years again to come back there i'll guarantee it maybe i can get out there you could take me over there that, that would be a blast oh, definitely i <laughs> the problem is i've got too many places to take you that's the good thing of london <laughs> i have to like start at 12 yeah. p.m because that's the great thing of london a lot of bars actually do open at 12 and then until three in the morning. So okay. the 15 hour of um, tasting should be legendary. Mm -hmm. But yeah, look, uh, Gabe, again, thanks a lot for joining the podcast. And it's a really big honor for you being the first American uh, to be on the show and uh, also speaking with us from the United States. So thanks a lot. It really does mean a lot to me. And uh, a lot of people have been looking forward to having you on. So big welcome to Life Behind Bars. Right on, brother. I'm I'm happy to be here, and you know, there's a, if I'm the first American, there's nowhere to go but up from here, dude. So you're you're good, dude. You're good. Yeah. You uh, you uh, get out here ever? No, um, I will in um, November. I'm going to New York, so that's the first time I'm ever going to visit the states. Um, but yeah, I would okay. definitely like to visit um, Texas because um, my friend Christian, I think it was the last episode I recorded, so he. He's okay. German, but he uh, actually lived in a long time, for a very long time in the States. And um, he's just telling me how the life is there, how it's quite relaxed, um, a lot of freedom, you know, and it's just very, he found it very peaceful. Um, I think he was in construction at the time, but then he started to kind of um, help out when there were like some rock concerts. And that's how he kind of fell in love with the bar. So yeah, I definitely want to make a visit there. Probably a road trip would be the best thing to do. I would say, because your country is so big. So probably a road trip would be the best thing. Um, and it'll take ages. Yeah, uh, what about you? Way. How did you... Um, sorry? That's a good way to see it, for sure. For sure. You, yeah, we'll, we'll good and bad, that's a good way to see the state. Fair enough, fair enough. But what about you then? So how was your journey to where <laughs> you are now? So you're now the general manager of the Midnight Rambler in Dallas. Um, how was your journey? 
Oh man, that's a that's a, a, a big question. So when I was younger, I started bartending um a long time ago. I'll just without telling you how fucking old I am, excuse me for cursing. Um but please do I started it. bartending in Las Vegas. Okay, and um so you know when I went to college in Las Vegas, I worked out there, and then I started bartending in a place called the Hard Rock Hotel. Uh, casino it's no longer there i think they're actually rebuilding it but um so i worked i bartended there there was a nightclub kind of the first of that new or that bottle service style you know over the top nightclub shit um but that one was kind of the first um incarnation of that style of bar um and this was 2000 2001 99 and Fuck, it was, a, yeah, 99, I think it was. And um, so that was kind of the genesis of like when I started bartending, you know, it's club bartending and one-on-ones and fast and shaking and all, you know, like go, 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 go. Um, and then with the bottle service, but the guy that I worked for, uh, his name is Sean McPherson. And he basically recreated nightlife in Los Angeles in the early 90s. I think he, he might have been a New Yorker or whatever, maybe went to New York. But um, anyways, he opened a bunch of books in Los Angeles and completely redid how people in that city drank. And just, you know, when I found out he was going to do something in Las Vegas, you know, because we would study, you know, some of these random guys in school, like fuck like i gotta work for this guy um so anyways i was able to get an interview with him and you know during the interview he's like so why'd you come to las vegas and i didn't you know i was a kid i was like 22 or something like maybe 21 i was fucking young and the only thing i could think of was like oh i had a drinking problem so i figured i should come here and he looked we at all me did like, that 21 wasn't it <laughs> yeah, yeah i like i said that in an interview he's like what'd you say I was like, yeah, you know, I uh, figured if I'm going to have a, a drinking or gambling problem, I should probably come here. He's like, all right, that's what I thought. You want to work for me? And I, Absolutely. And so, yeah, that, I guess the moral of the story is be honest. Um, when you're saying you said stupid shit, um, it might work. But I started working there in um, yeah, 99, 2000, whatever. I bartended there for a long time and then I stopped bartending um for probably 10 years, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Um, but I started hosting um, you know, the big nightclubs and that type of stuff. So, you know, I was completely away from the bar for a long time. And then um 2010, 2009, I kind of got tired of doing what I was doing. And I was like, well, I, I want to bartend again. And so in a bar, um, in kind of an art, older art scene, you know, music based neighborhood in Dallas called Deep Ellum. Um, it was um, started in 1875. Uh, really, wow. you know, it's kind of stayed. Yeah, it, it's a dope old neighborhood. And, um, you know, the neighborhood kind of up and down, up and down through, you know, the 150 or whatever years it is now that's been around. Um, but the cool thing, about that neighborhood is because there's so many artists that kind of flock to that and musicians and those type of kind of people that you could basically do uh, whatever the fuck you wanted down there. And people would, nice. you know, I don't know if they would respect it, but they would tolerate it for sure. Um, you know, so, you know, I opened that place and, you know, this is 2010 and, you know, kind of the, the swing away from, nightclubs and lounges and all that shit was kind of um you know taking hold at that time and kind of going towards you know, craft cocktails and all of that you know kind of what we're in right now i guess for lack of a better term but that was kind of the beginning of it and um you know when i was started i was like fuck what am i gonna do i don't want to do fucking jack and cokes like not that there's anything wrong with jack and cokes or one-on-ones and popping beers like that's how i you know paid for college or most of it um, but it's like, dude, I want to do... just the repetition of it probably gets annoying yeah. at a certain point. 
you say is the repetition yeah. of just always making Jack and Cokes, always serving beers, it just gets a bit too repetitive. Yeah, and and so you know when I was down there, I was like, well, fuck, I could do whatever I want, and so you know I started grabbing some books, and you know starting to read like what was going on, you know, around the world, and you know more specifically, you know, in New York City, and this is kind of boys only, and you know all of that, um, and I was like, oh, well, I could try, you know, do this, and I was at that time, dude. There was fucking nobody like that neighborhood had gone through kind of an explosion where it completely cleared out. And so there was nobody down there. So I was like, well, I could do it. Like worst case, like there's nobody down here right now. It doesn't really matter. Um, so I started doing that and it kind of had a foothold and I did that for 10 years. I had that bar um, for 10 years and then, you know, 20 happened, 2020 happened and COVID and, you know, obviously we don't have to go back in time to remember what happened with that, but you know, yeah, it died. It went the you know way of the dinosaur or whatever. You know, it. it um, so I wasn't doing anything, and this is the end of twenty twenty November December, and the people um, at the hotel uh, called me and they're like, "Hey, you're not doing anything. Do you want to do something?" Um, and I was like, yeah, it'd make it a lot easier to pay my bills if I was currently active. So I came over here um, to the Jewel and been running, you know, Midnight Ramblers ever since. So that's kind of a long story. Short issue, so oh, That's a good story. I mean, I got probably 20 questions uh, from your story, but uh, I think one of them, like you said, you started as a bartender um, and it was to make a quick buck. I did like I say, What's the best way to help with our drinking problem at 21? But you did say yeah. you did bartend in Vegas for a brief period of time. Um, how was that like? Because a lot of bartenders I speak to around Europe, a lot of them say their dream is actually to bartend mm -hmm. in Vegas. Is it a bit, is the hype wrong? Or what was your experience like? It was fucking awesome. And so, <laughs> you know, when I, it was amazing. I, like, if anybody tells you otherwise, they, uh, they're fucking nuts. But so let's just put it this way. When I started working there, uh, um, so the unions are very big in, in Las Vegas. Um, they're very powerful. So the, the hotels that aren't union, they they keep their wages set union way and they give all of the benefits we get your if you belong to the union. So that like when twenty one to what it was started, I think it Sixteen or seventeen dollars an hour, and you guys do your tips, you know, as far as taxes are concerned. But there, what you had to, you know, to claim your tips, obviously. So what they did in Las Vegas is they said, okay, cool. What all the people that work hourly for tips, put them together, we'll divide it, and then whatever that, that's what everybody has to claim. So he, what we had to claim legally and what we made were. Maybe different. I don't know. I don't want to get myself into trouble, but we made a ton of money when we were there. We were kids, right? 22, 23. And, you know, we're walking out yeah. with a lot of money every night. And we would, you know, and this was kind of before bottle service was really a thing. So people were coming to the bar and, you know, the, the interaction was great. And this is when before iPhones and Instagram and all that other bullshit. So, you know, people that were maybe more famous, athletes, musicians, they were used to going and hanging out at bars and it wasn't this fucking weird, get away from me, I'm going to be behind a rope type of thing. Obviously, it happened very quickly. You know, the energy is awesome. And, you know, we made a killing money-wise. We we all had insurance. We, you know, we worked three days a week. We got paid full-time. And then I was able to go to school, nice. you know, to college. Um, I didn't go very often because... You know, whatever we would get off at four or five in the morning, sometimes six morning, and then be a class at eight. So whatever that didn't work all the time. But um, and there, you know, even though it's a big city, like every I think in every big, you know, any of the um, industry is very small. Everybody knows everybody, and so we go from place yeah, to place. Yeah, exactly. Um, you always you're going to see your 
this one or that one and you know walking through the hotels and being able to cut lines and all that other bullshit you know especially when you're younger um and you're stupid and you got a you know a pocket full of 20s or whatever hundreds in your pocket and you're going and then when you get done you turn around and you go outside and you gamble for a couple hours and you know like um, sometimes that works out sometimes it doesn't but you know it was rad dude. and if you have the chance to go like bartend even if it's a you know a pickup for a weekend um at one of these places like for dude you should 1000 percent do it because uh, you know everybody that works there gets it like that's what they do for their life you know they are professional bartenders or professional whatever you know, cocktail servers or uh, servers so you know they they get it and they all have a sense of humor about it still and it it's rad like 1000 percent go into it uh, i'll definitely if I, if I have the chance i'll definitely jump at it and one thing you said which is very true i think like i mean if i think in london as um to my bartending days you know so where i bartend in the area of covent garden it's very central in london and we had a few bars around us which people would think they're rivals but they're not they're you could even say they're friendly competition but we all like to see each other we'd all go visit each other but when it comes to that saturday night and we are all just shaking making cocktails uh, banging our bar blades making noise and i used to say this when i was a manager to my team I used to say, you guys are the celebrities of this area. You know, people come here to see you. You know, when people order a cocktail, they're not actually on their phone waiting for you to make the cocktail. They're watching you make the cocktail. And, you know, sometimes when you get this nice thrill, this nice rush, you're making a cocktail, you see this girl, you find her really cute. You tell her to come behind the bar and then she'll make the cocktail. And then, you know, we all make a bit of a noise. It's a birthday we get the couple to come behind the bar. So, you know, we do want it to give it that big, nice feeling. Because, you know, everyone comes to bars on Saturday to have fun, to forget about their week. They probably had a very uh, stressful week, some stuff they want to forget about, stuff they want to celebrate. So I think that's true. That's very important for people to do that. And each bartender has then their own personality. You know, there's a bartender um, I really like called um, Nathan. He works in a, a bar called Be At One. And he goes all out, you know, when the song, when there's a song that he likes, he jumps on top of the bar, he unbuttons half his shirt, uh, they throw crushed ice everywhere. But that's what people want to see. And I think that's so good to see. Of course, you could go to some bars where they're a bit more calm and sophisticated. Sure. But yeah, but every bartender is different. Um, and just to the point that you just were saying as well. So because in 2010, when you arrived, there was no one doing what you kind of were seeing was happening in New York with drinks. Um, so what would be, let's say now, so now in your bar, the Midnight Rambler, what is kind of the, the usual drinks that you would sell to your customers? Well, yeah, you know, in, in 10, you know, 2010, there were, there were people doing it. Like I wasn't the only one, but it was, you know, theoretically a brand new kind of version of this industry. You know, there's a handful of guys that were doing it and girls, whatever, women, however you want to say it but you know there's people that were doing it but it wasn't it was still a new it was kind of like what the fuck are these guys doing type of thing like why is it taking so long type of thing but um you know when, when we're here at, at rambler at least you know the the very first cocktail that we try to get out or whatever you know it's something that's somebody's had before old-fashioned martini manhattan like something of you know that classic range um, you know, because the, the bar, you know, it can get loud. The hotel that it's in is beautiful. You know, the, the room itself is beautiful. So we don't want people to feel out of place, you know, so we, you know, the, the goal is to get them into, you know, a security blanket where they feel at home and feel comfortable. And then the next cocktail, okay, cool. Do you want to see something off the menu? Do you want to do, you know, where things are pushing out a little bit further, um, but you know the I, the most important thing, at least when we start, the you know standard of service with people is making sure that they feel comfortable, um, and then you know pulling stuff off the back bar and letting them try, you know a random mezcal or a random brandy or or you know whatever, you know and then you can take that journey with the guests together. Uh, but to start, you know, and it's like going to any, you know, nice restaurant if they can't, you know, at least in, in the states if you go to a steakhouse. You know, they'll have a hamburger on the menu, go during lunch, 
and have the hamburger. And if they can't do a hamburger, they probably can't execute something that's super technical and super difficult because they can't do something that theoretically should be easy to somebody at that kind of standard, if that makes sense. Um, you know, when, you know, when I go to bars, you know, I'll, you know, I'm more of a shot type of person anyways, if I do drink. So I'll just that type of person. You know, we definitely need to hang out soon. <laughs> and, yeah, for sure. So, you know, I'll get, you know, a shot of mezcal and whatever or tequila and just kind of hang out and watch and, you know, see how the interaction is with people. And, you know, um, is that at the end of the day to me, that's more important than, you know, if, you know, fuck, you can throw it away and start a new one. But if yeah. you get that human interaction, well, fuck it, like I'm out. You like, and people, you know, it's people, like you said, like they would on a Saturday night or whatever, they, they want to come and they don't want to think about whatever it is they walked outside to come inside from. Um, they want to have a good time. You know, and it's like Nathan jumping on the bar and like, pulling his chest out and, you know, people throwing ice all over, like, you know, the shunt. They want that interaction, um, you know, and I think that's the most important part of, of our jobs. Um, you know, obviously the medium that we work in is alcohol and ice and booze and stirring and shaking and all that other bullshit. Um, but yeah. the real, the real, real thing bartenders should be very good at is how do you interact with another human being and get them to feel comfortable? So yeah. I don't know if I answered that question or not. Before I get well, the fucking, uh, yeah. so. No, you answered it completely different than I was expecting to. And I like that. I think, you know, it's true. It's, you don't, you can't really expect someone just to uh, order this because everyone orders it. You kind of want to figure out the person first. You want to kind of see why are they there? Are they there because they probably need to set something out? Are they curious on a few drinks? Are they there with friends? So you kind of want to find the moments is almost as important as the drink. So see what they're in the mood in. And I completely yeah. agree with you. I think bartenders i had this talk about a lot of bartenders are introverts but when they're working they actually do socialize um and i think a lot of bartenders needs to yeah. have that kind of skill where they you know when you polish the glass and you're talking to a customer um and i, I had my first experience when i was way too young for it so i'm sure this has happened to you where a guy will come up to you asking a bit of advice because his wife is cheating on him or something like that so my first ever conversation like that happened when I was 17 and I was working in a shisha bar. Um, and I always looked older than I looked. So <laughs> I had this guy, he <laughs> came to my bar and, um, you know, he was looking at, uh, we didn't have that many spirits. I mean, I think we had like four different types of whiskeys, three different types of gins and, you know, a few liquors, but the rest were all um, just shisha. Um, and the guy just looks at me, he's like, okay, I'll have this whiskey. And then he's quiet. I ask if he's okay. And then he's like, oh, well, you know what? You're a bartender. So um, actually, I've got a few things to let out my chest. So he starts going on that he's seeing this girl. They've been going out for a while, but um, it looks like she doesn't really want him. But sometimes it looks like she does. He takes her on these expensive trips, on these expensive restaurants. And all he gets back from her is a hug. And then, you know, this, this 17 year old me trying to figure out when I don't even know a thing about girls. And eight years later, it's still the same thing. And yeah, I kind of went to him. I was like, well, it looks like she's kind of using you for her money. Um, and he's like, yeah, you're right. You know what? You're quite wise. How old are you? And I go, I'm 17. And he looks at me and he was like, oh, you shouldn't even be serving me. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was my first experience. And it was it, it was uh, interesting and funny. But it did teach me a lot. And, you know, fast forward now to if I speak to a customer, you know, there's a lot more that you could talk about. And again, it's going through all these experiences that makes us better at the jobs we do. And it always goes back to the same thing, mm -hmm. being a people person, making sure that you can talk to a person, see how they're feeling, how can you cheer them up? You know, the, the aim is always, it's not for them to leave your bar hammered. It's for them to leave the bar happy, you know, um, enjoying yeah. the experience. Um, So... With you, uh, when you when you're working, and as we talked about, you guys, I think it was 150 could fit in your venue. Um, what is the go to? Not go to drink, but um, so I'm trying to find the right words for it. 
Um, so, for example, on a, if a customer's ordering a whiskey, now, of course, when it comes to bourbon, there's no better place than where you are right now to have a nice bourbon. So how can you attract a, someone who kind of likes their whiskeys but hasn't tried Scotch, Irish whiskeys? Um, would you try and persuade them to taste them or would you go through a different direction? You know, if if it's busy, you know, obviously that conversation is a little bit more difficult to have. But, yeah. you know, if it's not that busy and especially back at my other place, um, you know, I, I would definitely walk them through. Okay, you know, you're a bourbon guy. Do you like rum? You know, you, you know, we'll start pulling some aged rums down or some aged, you know, reposado tequilas or anejos or brandy for sure. You know, um, you know, cognac for sure. And you just start lining them up and, you know, go through that, that walk with everybody. And, you know, the, the cool thing with it is <clears throat> like most people, unless they only drink one fucking thing, you know, they're like, I drink whatever, Cuddy Sark and a splash of water. And I'm, you know, I'm a hundred years old. That's all I've drank for the past 75 years. Like most people will be willing to try something new. And especially if like they want, you know, People want to try different shit. They just maybe don't know how to get to that place with somebody else. Um, but if you're just like, here, dude, try this, 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 this. You start talking about it. And, you know, you have where it's not an infomercial, but it's a conversation. And you take, you know, let them taste it. And if they like it, whatever or not. Okay, try this, try this, or this. You know, you have that conversation with people. What it, what it does is it usually attracts people from other, you know, the outsides of them. So now they're not sitting by themselves. They're sitting with a group of people they may not have known five minutes ago, but they're all jumped in the same boat. And so they're on a together, you know, so it it's a good way to, to create camaraderie between theoretically strangers um, and get them to try and do different things. Um, so yeah, that, you know, that's what I would, try to do if somebody's like yeah i'm only a bourbon person like you start pulling stuff and making them try it dude. and you know, most of the time unless they're just want to be contrary and they're going to find something that they like that's completely different than what they thought they liked if that makes sense you know no, i does. think that's the part yeah and again like you said it's that experience that you get to know them and then see how open they are to try new things so one thing we talked um when we had our, our follow-up last week, uh, which I think a lot of people are quite curious, is so in the UK, we go very by the metric system. So we're all right. by the milliliter um, right. and a lot of places in the United States go by ounces. Um, and you said it yourself. So your drinks, are the measurements are made with ounces, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, when there's certain drinks that, let's say, you, you use less than half an ounce or a quarter of an ounce how can you adjust it um to make sure it actually goes how the taste you want it to taste get it correct yeah it you know that's the hard part and you know i think you know what i think the most important thing too for american bartenders is to go and watch bartenders from the uk or european bartenders work um there is you know obviously this is a blanket statement but from what i have seen I've gone and watch um, bartenders, you know, where y'all are at, is they're very fucking precise. Like 50 is 50, 60 is 60, 30, right? And, um, you know, and most of the bartenders over there that I watch are technically, you know, amazing, superior probably to us in the States. This is what it is. Um, you know, where, you know, over here, Maybe we have a hard time counting past two or three. I don't know. So 30 and 20, 30, 50, 60, you know, might shake somebody's head too much. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's, you know, culturally, like we've, we've, we've learned bartending with all these two ounces. And, you know, um, but is it going to be as precise as a drink that you would get um, in Europe that's made, you know, with no leaders? No. Um, but I think there's a little bit of um, give over here where it doesn't necessarily need to be as precise. Um, and maybe that's going to change now that the line guys have 
um, you know, dropped in Washington, D.C., you know, a couple of years ago or wherever it is and slowly probably making their way west. But um, so maybe okay. that'll change. Yeah, but I, you said something, and it's true, but probably as well, I think before, the cocktails didn't have to be that precise, you know. So there was probably no need to um, use milliliters, especially when the United States never went with the metric system. So, you know, maybe some Canadian places might have done it, but um, in the States, it's a bit different. When, when I took my bartending course, uh, the measurements we had to learn was a bit different. So it would start from 7.5 milliliters, and then 15, and then 22 and a half. Um, however, when you actually start okay. working in bars it, itself, um, you learn by, um, so every five ml is a count. And then you kind of adjust your own way to counting. So um, I think I've got a bottle here for my, so it's my little glow in the dark flare bottle. So when we're pouring, nice. you know, if we're going to do a dash, which is just five ml, we're generally just going to do basically a little drop like that. And then if we're going to do 10 ml, it's kind of like a little movement. And then the way I count, um, so if I'm going to count um, 25 ml, which is our single shots here in the UK, I'll go one, two, three, four, and bounce. And then if you want to do 50, you just do the same thing. So it's a way that we learn. Um, it takes a while to get it right. Definitely. Um, it's just like everything, practice makes perfect. Um, right. But uh, it's I wouldn't even say it's a skill. It's something very easy to learn, just like remembering how to make cocktails. You know, I'm sure um, a lot of your customers go to your bartenders and they're like, oh, how do you remember everything in your head? But it's just practice makes perfect. And that's the way it should be. Uh, so for my next topic, which I wanted to talk to you about the future of bartending, not just um, in general or the United States, but I don't know if this is a topic you'd just like to discuss because to go to the future, I just want to go a bit to the past, which was the worst time for bartenders, which was COVID. Um, and, you know, it was really difficult for everyone. Now, I know some places have recovered, but I think it took a massive, massive hit into our industry not just um, for people who were working at the time and a lot of great places we lost, but also um, the future, how it's kind of like lost a bit of the generation where people want to become bartenders. You know, you don't get as much as it now. You know, the supply chains are broken. Um, it's just kind of everything that should have, that could have gone our way didn't. And to be set back a few years, but it's not just going to hurt us for a few years. It's going to hurt us for five, six, or even more. Um, so in the United States, when COVID happened, just in general, how how bad did it affect uh, everyone? It was bad, man. It was bad. Um, you know, I lost my place in 20. Um, you know, yeah. I was, you know, I was 14 days from 10 years. Um, 13 days, 13 days. Um, you know, the last day that, that I was open was March 17th. Um, it was maybe it was 16th, I think it was 17th that Sunday and then never again gone. Um, you know, and after that happened, you know, that happened to a lot of, a lot of places. Some places were able to, um, you know, wade through that shit, um, and, you know, make it to, make it to the end of it. But, you know, some of, you know, the people left, you know, some people like weren't able, if you can't pay your bills, how are you supposed to be able to stay where you're at and living at a certain, you know, people were used to making whatever it was. And then that drops 90%. Like, what are you supposed to do? People moved out of the state. They got different, you know, they completely pivoted from the industry. And those, you know, like you said, like those people, they're not fucking coming back. Um, if they would have, they would have already been back, um, you know, and the kids, you know, that 17 year old kid to 23 year old kid um, that was like, okay, cool. I'm going to, I understand that I have to learn from here to get to here. That kid, like, he's not there anymore for the most part. Where before, like when I was working at my old place, there, there'd be 10 of those kids a week that come by and be like, hey, dude, you know, I want to blah, blah, blah. Okay, Rad, like eventually we'll get to you. And we'll, it's smart tending in general is a very male dominated, um, adventure, lack of a better fucking term, I don't know, um, industry. No, no, um, you're right, absolutely right about that. It, it, 
you know, now and it, you know, it could be, for lack of a better way to explain it, you know, very white male um, industry doesn't like it. It's not that fucking way anymore, Doug. They or you know, when I reopened, you know, it wasn't important for me to find you know, male or a person that looks like me, you're a person from this nationality or that nationality, was, you know, find somebody that I could believe in and would take, um, you know, criticism and, you know, somebody that would learn. And, you know, I, luckily for me, you know, I found a, a female lead and she's fucking awesome. And, you know, it, it was very important for me to be able to try to teach her as much as I can. And, you know, push her as much as I can to get her to go, you know, where I know she can be, you know, going forward. And I think it's imperative for everybody that's maybe my generation to find people that maybe aren't what we we learned under, you know, um, and find people that don't look like that and pour as much into them as they want to take so they can make that next step where you know kids might have been looking for a kid that looked and was shaped like this okay maybe that person but what about this person and this person and this person um you know and i've been lucky that i've been able to you know attract some people that don't look like the box um yeah and i went out of a way to teach as much as i can until they're up to fuck up uh, but i think going forward, you know, where it was kind of very linear, it's going to open and be very much more of a circle in this industry where more people are going to say like, okay, I can fucking do that too. And it, you don't have to look like this or sound like this or only speak this language or, you know, whatever. That's at least my hope kind of going forward to combat the shit that we lost. And so. It's tough though, because I, I would say that when I work with um after COVID, like you said, uh, first you're right, it used to be quite male dominated, and then there became a part of the ratio. I think in general was fifty fifty male to female bartenders, and then I remember I had a team at one point which was eighty percent or even ninety percent female, um, and this was yeah. when there was a big staff retention crisis where your average bartender would just last a month or really any job in the UK during that time. And then, yeah, when I saw that uh, our team was quite heavily dominated by females, you know, we would try to hire the most uh, qualified, but there was a time when no one wanted to be a bartender. So if you knew basically how to make a gin tonic, we would already be interested at the time. Um, but then it did lead to quite a lot of problems as well. I think, and, you know, this is not yeah. to do with any sexism, but it's facts. You know, I think when you've got a group of boys all together with two, three girls, there's never really any issues with it. The girls feel very comfortable. They feel very safe around them. You know, I used to be like that with a bar, as a bartender. You know, the girls I used to work with, which they used to live with me as well, we would uh, joke with them a lot. We'd make fun of them a lot. But if any issue happened, we'd always be there to protect them and vice versa. Um, so then when I did have a very strong female-led team, it led to a lot of uh, arguments and discussions and it wasn't really healthy. You know, I think we kind of saw it was this girl once talked to this girl. Um, there'd be a lot of them calling in sick. Um, and then I'll check their Instagram. They'd be going out the day before. Um, so yeah, that wasn't the healthiest <laughs> part. Um, right. I thought we, yeah, that wasn't the healthiest part, but then after that as well, you know, it was just, you, you seem like no one wanted to push forward. You know, I think when, like when I was a bar back, my dream was to be a bartender. And, you, you know, when we were washing glasses, we would wash the glasses as fast as we can. Just because if there was two minutes that I had nothing to do and there was a cocktail to be made, a bar back wanted to do it. He wanted to prove he was ready to be a bartender. And then when the day came, he became a bartender. It was like Will Smith in the pursuit of happiness, that moment of celebration. And it kind of feels like that's gone. There's still a bit of it, but not as much. And I think people as well, like kind of like everyone wants to be a supervisor, but being a supervisor, it's, you know, it's, I always say it's your everyone's bar back. And 
being the supervisors, motivating the team, having fun with them, not just having fun with them when they're hitting a high, but if you're really busy, the team's quite burnt out, everyone's struggling, you know, you got to help them carry the boats, you know, you got to motivate them and put them right. And yeah, this is what I think COVID, it just destabilized everything. Um, but there was stuff again, moving forward to the future. I think um, the good thing was a lot of people who stayed at home, their knowledge in drinks actually improved. Um, a lot of them tried to make cocktails at home uh, or just kind of doing their own little parties at home, which was not a big issue. Um, so, yeah, I think it's kind of moved stuff to a different direction. Now, one thing that I would say kind of makes bartending bartending, it's it's diversity. And with the UK, when Bre Brexit happened and COVID, we no longer got Italian, Brazilian, um, American. We, we The only bartenders we'd get would be English bartenders. And I'll say it, they're not very good. <laughs> Um, some of them are, but if you put the average Italian bartender to the average English bartender, it's it's not even a competition. The Italians, even though they complain a lot and they like to express themselves, they're still one of the best bartenders there is. Um, and I loved working with them. However, now we don't get that many of them, which is really upsetting to see. We don't get that many... Uh, people from outside of Europe or just even in Europe itself so it is painful because you know it's kind of hard to motivate a 19 year old kid who's in college to be a bartender when before it was just people who just wanted to um, yeah. get a job they arrive in London all right bar back I'll do that and then they fell in love with the job and then you see them four or five years later they're causing a scene in great bars around uh, around Europe in general as well. But yeah, hopefully we can get it back. You know, I think that, you know, I think the hard part too is kids, they see the finished product, right? On, you know, a picture on Instagram that it's a beautiful cocktail and then it has all the you know, like, oh, I, theoretically, I can do that, Right. You can count to whatever you can theoretically make that cocktail if you're giving all the instruction. But what they don't understand is, okay, that's one time. And you might have five hours to make a cocktail where in a real life bar setting, you know, that has to happen thousands of times. And it yeah. has to be as close to perfect as possible and it has to be clean and make sure you're counting that, you know, the, the money's correct. You know, this is a fucking business dog. It's not, it's not, you're doing something for a contest and, you know, kind of fucking peacocking and showing how pretty you are around. Like, don't you, like, we have, this is something that happens thousands of times a weekend. And then you go pay your bills and then you go dick off and go get drunk and eat a kebab or whatever it is. And then come back and you do it again on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and Sunday. Like, like this is, it's not a vacuum. It's, you know, a living organism. And, you know, I think once sometimes when, you know, they see that they're like, Oh fuck, I thought I could make one drink and ta -da, and, you know, give me a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds or whatever. And off I go. Um, you know, so yeah. sometimes I think that that kind of jolt to the system when they see the reality of the situation and like somebody cute, like how are we going to get that out of here? Like, Oh, you're, you get to get down and pick it up, um, you know, or broken glass or, or you know, whatever. Um, you know, so I think, you know, the how I deal with it with, with the younger guys, the girls, uh, is, you know, I will be the first one. Like, if somebody throws up or something just fucked up happens, I will bring them and I will show them how to do it, right? If you yeah. got sick, I would, you know, then I would say, do you see see how that's done? Like, yeah, you see how I pick up the shit? Yes. Okay, cool. Exactly. You know that I can do it. You can do it next time going forward. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's with the kids that are, have kind of said, you know what, let's do this. It's going to take people, it's going to take guys, whatever, in our generation to spend more time with them and not coddle the fucking kids, but make sure they understand as much as possible. So when they get a little bit further, they get to 24 or 25, 26, maybe that, that generation after them will say, pay attention to them and they'll have, you know, it's 
they're like, oh, okay, cool. These old fuckers taught me right. So I can teach the next kid. And then maybe that that connection will, will happen again. Um, or I mean, you're absolutely just, right. No, you're right. Because um, like, I'll give you an example. I, I was it a few weeks ago. Um, I was still serving tables and the bar got quite busy and then someone took my section. So I went behind a bar and I worked with these bartenders and, you know, they're not enjoying it. And then if you're really busy and you've got loads of drinks to do, you're really not going to enjoy the job. I went behind a bar and when I'm behind a bar, you know, I'm if the sinker ship, if the ship is sinking, I'm still singing. Let's put it like that. So, you know, I'm joking with a few people. We're getting the work done. And then I had this bartender, um, and, you know, I was just trying to pump it up, motivate him. I said, oh, look at that cute girl. Unless it's okay, here's, look, shake this cocktail, give it to the girl, say it's on the house. Like those type of things to kind of get them motivated. And then they finished the shifts. And I was like, okay, let's go on a night out. So I'd done to them what I used to always do with my friend when we used to finish work as a bartender. Used to go to be at one, finish at midnight. We used to go there until three in the morning. And... um and then I remember after three in the morning, the bar is closed. We went somewhere until eight in the morning. And if we had work at 12, we would be there at work at 12. So I was kind of showing them as well. It's like, it's work, but it's also you're a bartender outside of work. And uh, it's hard to find their motivation, but I think you said it and it's very true. Spending time with them. Um, when someone throws up, you gave such a good example. You know, to be honest, it's always kind of the bosses that do it, but when the general managers do it, it's because they know their team can do it. If you have someone who, like a bartender or a bar back, who has to clean someone's throw up, and the worst thing they can say, it's, I don't get paid enough for this. That is a very bad thing you could do on my books. You know, it's it doesn't matter how much you get paid, it's the job itself. Um, but yeah, look, it, it's just some people are like that. But I've, I know it's a soft generation, but we'll get there. We'll get there. I'm quite optimistic we'll with this. Yeah. And uh, so look, to the next subject. So not just cocktails, but drinks. You said you're an avid mezcal drinker. Um, what are a few drinks would you say that us in Europe, we don't know that we should kind of get more familiar with that you guys in the States are pretty good with? Oh, shit. Um, you know what? I wouldn't even... Man. Then it just seems like every time that I'm over there or, or watching what you guys do, you're a little bit further ahead than we are. Um, you know, I think we obviously in Texas we're lucky because you know proximity to Mexico and the ability to get like basically I think is obviously probably a thousand times easier for us. You know, it's a two-hour hour flight from here to. Oaxaca um yeah and then you know you can kind of go all over whether it's there Michelle Khan or police go um if there's anybody from Oaxaca that's watching this please send me a ticket I would love to go um I've not been yet too. I'm asking asking kindly he would like to go the two of us would like to go together um you know so I don't you know cocktail wise or drink wise I don't know but just the the stuff that you know like when my buddies go down there you know, they're able to, you know, come back and they all have, you know, water bottle, this random one and that random one. Um, it, you know, to be able to taste stuff, you know, as it is made by whoever's making it is probably the, the coolest thing, especially being in Texas, you know, because there's so many guys that, you know, my friends that still have family down there that drive down, you know, their grandma down, their grandma's down. You know, visiting family, and then they'll go and just pop out, and then they'll go and grab all of this random stuff, and then they come back and check that out, check this out, check that out. And, um, you know, it's, it's most of the time it's written down and they've kept the log on what exactly is in this water bottle. But sometimes you're like, I don't know what the fuck that is. And he doesn't know what it is, but it's amazing. And, you know, trying to figure out how to go back on that adventure and go back down and find it. Um, but yeah, you know, I definitely think if you're out, you know, in Europe or in the UK, you should come to Texas. Um, Houston's fucking amazing. 
Um, Dallas is a great city as well. Like we, like the community here is fucking awesome. And so is Austin and San Antonio. Um, you know, come here, hang out in one of these cities and jump on a plane and, you know, we'll all go to Oaxaca or, or um, Guadalajara or wherever and, and go find the shit out. But, um, yeah, as far, but to say like a cocktail that we might know that you guys don't, I, I wouldn't even know where to start with that. Um, I, you, know, I you said something and it's true. Um, I know there's some stuff that European bartenders might have the edge over comparing to the States, but you know, there's something that you guys have that we don't. And I think when I go to New York as well, it'll be quite interesting to see how the bartenders are. Uh, I'm definitely going to keep Texas probably on my uh, next trip to, um, to the States, just because every time I speak to someone, you know, people love Miami, they love California. Um, they like that. Even Washington, they say it's not as boring as you think. But when I hear the state of Texas, everyone loves it like a ridiculous amount. Yeah. Um, so I'll make sure I'll keep in touch with you when I do go visit. Hopefully next year. Um, but yeah, but like I said, I think you guys, especially with your, I'd love to, I'd love to be there. But but you guys with your social skills, um, your enthusiasm, you know, sometimes I do see some bartenders who are okay here in, in London, but it's like. Where's your enthusiasm? Where's that energy? You know, um, I have a joke with a friend of mine, Cyril. He's a bartender and he's got a very French face. This is what we like to say to him. So he'll go see you and he kind of looks like he's already angry at the world. And But his bartending skills is amazing. And he's a social guy, but when he works, he has, we call it the French face. So if, I've, and I think when he talks, he will try and talk um of his knowledge which is ridiculous you know this guy could tell you the difference between um a rum that's been aged seven years to 15 years and why it should be a solero rum and not just a single barrel run but he, his knowledge is great but when he tries to explain the french comes out of him but if you have a if you have a nice american a vibe to it i think it'll be different i love you cereal i'm sorry but i had to <laughs> But yeah, uh, look, I think the stuff that we can learn from each other, um, a hundred percent. And um, I think as well going forward, again, cocktails are going to be cocktails. There's always going to be different new types. Um, hopefully, there'll be more American cocktails. But also, I think now the world's it's. I I expect it's going to expand. So. Before COVID, Amsterdam was actually going to kind of start to become a new cocktail hub. Because I had a few people who were going to go work in Amsterdam, but then COVID happened. Um, Czech Republic, it's getting quite popular as well. Um, I think if you go to Prague, because the nightlife there is absolutely amazing. And now they're kind of trying to open really nice uh, professional cocktail bars. And then the rest you have to see, you know, I had a friend of mine, he, he got invited to spend a week in the Caribbean. And um, he basically had to see what was the problem with this um, resort and identify the problems. And basically he said it's all quite easy to go. Like it's sex on the beaches, pina coladas and, and strawberry daiquiris. And they said, oh, should we change it? Should we make this an amazing menu? And he said, no, you shouldn't because what you're making is for people on holiday, they went on holiday to enjoy the sun. They don't want to get a lecture on 10 minutes on what rums this has made. Some people do, but most people who go to the Caribbean and go on a vacation and are staying in the resort, not really. If they go to these specific bars, it can be different. But yeah, I think it's just us doing what we're doing now, uh, staying in touch, working together, seeing stuff that we're not doing and uh, vice versa. And then I think we all come with our own uh, ideas and projects. So yeah, uh, but like I said, I really do need to go and see how you guys are doing there massively. I think you'll have a good time. I think you would have a good time. Definitely. And especially people in especially. New York. I, yeah, with New York in November, maybe we could figure out a way to meet you out there. Like, um, have a good time out there. So, Yeah, definitely. I'll, like I said, I'll definitely stay in touch with you. And um, there's a lot of places in the States I still like to go target. And same, if you come to London, yeah, I think just going to bars in a two mile radius you're going to have so many uh, and it's going to be great and hope you could even watch a, a Chelsea match with me 
Um, so that, yeah, just yeah, before we go, yeah. yeah, well, it's just Chelsea because that's the only option you have. Me, okay. So, um, Gabriel, before before we go, just um, what would be your piece of advice uh, for the next generation of bartenders? Um, okay, so the most important thing that they should understand is about is first with the guests. It is very difficult for people to stop their life, get in their car, get in a, get in a bus, get in a taxi, get in the the subway, leave from where they're at, go to where you're at, get out of that mode of transportation, get into the bar, sit down, and sit across from you. It, it takes an effort. And that effort should be rewarded by you giving a fuck, right? You should respect the fact that they could have went anywhere in the world anything that they wanted to do, but they stopped their life, they came and they went to come to see you. So it's imperative that you respond correctly, right? And so things need to be clean. You need to do it as best as you can. You need to make sure that they understand, that you understand that they did all this to come see your fucking ass and make sure that they have a good time and that they're better leaving than they were coming. Um, you know, anybody can learn how to make a cocktail. It's not fucking difficult. Um, you could teach, trust me, I could teach my six-year-old how to make all these cocktails. It's all it is, is repetition, repetition, repetition. That's not fucking important. Um, doing it well and doing it where it looks effortless, obviously that takes more time and you have to be serious about it, um, you know, and respect where you're working, respect fucking self. Take care of the biggest thing is where guys my age and probably your age, where they spent years and years and years of, you know, being self destructive. Um, I respect self destructive. I don't trust people that are, don't have a little bit of self destruction in them. Um, but yeah, you don't you have to go fast. all night long. You don't have to do it. Yeah, you have to worry about your fucking mental health, dog, and you have to take care of your body. And if you're able to do that and learn <clears throat> the you know the normal stuff that, that every has to learn, why that goes with what that this goes with that and become somebody that somebody wants to see you'll be like. Um, so kind of long story short the process, respect the people that are teaching you, respect the people that are coming to see you and take care of your fucking self. Um, if you do those three things, you'll be all right. Yeah, no, I tell you, that's words of wisdom. That's something I'm still trying to figure myself out. I, you know, I'm still young. I'm still 25, but oh yeah, I think um, with a lot of stuff, not putting myself first, yeah, there's quite a lot of things. Time. Yeah, well, going at it, working hard at it, but it's true. Um, and again, Gabriel, thank you so much, uh, guys. Uh, hopefully, I get to send this to you. Um, I just need to get still your address. We've only got about. Eight hoodies left now for Life Behind Bars and our Mercenaries hoodies, guys. So if anyone wants it, just private message me. And um, I've got one reserved for you, Gabriel. I hope you could send. And guys as well, God River, finally back in stock after two months. We've got our God River energy drinks. They're back. Slightly new ingredients. So now you can have them fresh and on regular temperature, which is great. And um, you can mix it with drinks. Um, I know energy drinks and alcohol is not the biggest popular thing in the world but it's still quite nice and uh, again big thank you to you Gabriel thanks for being on the show and uh, hopefully next time you talk um, for this event will be in person but a big thank you for everyone there awesome brother and um, I will get your mailing address so we can send some to you so you could uh, you could wear some stuff from our side especially go see Chelsea so <laughs> All right, that'll be an honor. Well, again, Gabe, all the best. Thank you so much. Awesome. Cheers, mate. And hopefully we'll see you soon, yeah?